The subject for today is the demise of the Christian faith. The demise of the Christian faith. Now can I go on and be bold? And tell you what's happening? Within the past four months, I have spoken with approximately 12 to 15 pastors from various denominations who have explained to me that there's been a drastic decline in their church membership. Now here's the deep thing, y'all. Each one of them had pretty much the same concern or complaint as the others. The three major reasons that I've heard from these ministers is people don't love the Lord like they used to. That's the first most common complaint I've heard. And the first person I heard that from was my mom. <laughs> the second most common complaint that I've heard was that people are unstable. People are weak-minded or won't commit themselves. And the third most common complaint is there's a spirit of disobedience <laughs> in the church today. Folk don't want to obey their leader. Now, there's no doubt that there is a major decline in church attendance. It's happening everywhere. At one point, I took it personal, and I thought, you know, it was in my ministry. But I found out that it wasn't just my ministry. It's happening everywhere. But I submit to you, and those who are watching me on television, pastors, teachers, religious leaders, that the major reason why people are becoming disgruntled discontented, dissatisfied, mm -hmm. yeah. displeased, unhappy, irritated, yeah. and angry yeah. with their church is because people are finding out yeah. <laughs> that the hope that they have been given is not real. It's a false hope. You see, y'all, nothing is more devastating to a person than to find out that they've been lied to. Can I get a witness? Nothing is more devastating to a person than to realize that they've been misled. That they've been deceived or that they've been manipulated. That's devastating. So this is not about the fact that people don't love God like they used to. I found out that people do love God. This is not about people being unstable and weak-minded. And I do agree that there are some unstable people. Uh, if you look at some people, you'll see that they don't stay on the same job long. Uh, they move from one house to another every three to four months. Some people are just unstable. Yeah. So don't expect stability when they walk into a church. Yeah. But this is not about people not wanting to obey leadership. Uh, this is about people who have given their life yes. right. Right. and their substance to something that they are finding out does not stand up That's right. to the test of scrutiny. Yes. 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 Doesn't stand up to critical analysis. Yes. Yes. Doesn't stand
stand up to the challenge, doesn't stand up to the undeniable evidence that is now coming to light. You see, in the past, the masses were kept in the dark about what they had been made to believe. In fact, it wasn't until the mid to late 16th century when the incredible Bible <laughs> was finally made available for the common man, as they say, to read. We need to ask ourselves, why did the Bishop of London send out an order that all copies of the Bible were to be confiscated. Why did he do that? Why did they send out an order that the clergy, the clergy is to burn all of the Bibles? Why did they issue such an order? In fact, if anyone was caught with a Bible, the penalty was death by burning. Now that's some deep stuff, y'all. Late 16th century. If you got caught with a Bible, you could be burned at the stake. Now, of course, I'm talking about the Christian church. And when I say the Christian church, I mean the Roman church. You see, the truth is the clergy realized that if the people had access to the book and they could read it for themselves, that the program of control would come to an end. No longer could they control the people. The income of the church would crumble. Yes. The power of the church would crumble. So therefore, let's return the ability to control the minds of the masses back to the pulpit. Y'all yes. following this? You see, if people's eyes came open, they would begin to challenge the, the authority of the church. In other words, the veneration of canonized saints would be challenged. The so-called Virgin Mary would be challenged. And if you challenge her virgin birth, then it stands to follow then that you're going to challenge the credibility of this so-called virgin-born baby. They could not allow that. Y'all check this out. In 1515, what year did I just say? One more time, what year? In 1515, Pope Leo X, right. write it down, don't take my word for it. Pope Leo X in the year 1515 said these words, I quote him, what profit hath not this fable of Christ brought to us? End of quote. Now, allow me to transliterate that. All right. Here's what the man said. Look at how much money we've made from this tale about a figure that we created called Jesus Christ. Here we see one of the most powerful popes in the history of the Christian church confessing the truth. Yes. You see, the problem is that the masses of the people don't know the truth that Pope Leo X knew. Yes. 
The Christian faith was, I say it again, was the most influential belief system in the Western world for more than 1,000 years. But guess what, y'all? It ain't as healthy today as it was 100 years ago. And among black African people, it ain't as healthy today as it was 10 years ago. The reason for this is people are coming to realize the same truth that Pope Leo the 10th spoke about. And thanks to liberation ministries and teachers, black African people are coming face to face with these hard, cold facts at a speed that has to be reckoned with. God has revealed to me that the light of right knowledge, I didn't say the light of knowledge, the light of right knowledge is getting brighter and brighter and the level of faith that individuals supposedly had in this fabrication is diminishing because each day the light of right knowledge gets brighter and brighter. This is why the demise of the Christian faith is taking place. You see, one of our out-of-state study group coordinators called me the other day and explained to me that people keep expressing their dissatisfaction and how unhappy they are in their church. We heard testimony this morning of a sister who said, I'm, I stopped going to church. You see, people, the program ain't working no more. Our coordinator told me that even though people have said they don't want to go to their church, the dilemma is they keep holding on to Jesus. So I explained to her, I said, the reason for this, my sister, is because people have become bored with the powerless rituals that are practiced in churches. Believe it or not, y'all, folk are getting tired of that piece of little, little piece of cracker. Not really understanding what it's about. People are getting tired of drinking a little tiny glass of Welch's grape juice. Not really understanding what it's about. You see, we have a generation of thinking people coming along. I explained to her, even though people are bored with the rituals, had one brother say to me, at least they can warm the water up. You're going to baptize me? Why you got to freeze me to death? Here we are in the, um, in the 21st century, and it's still got ice cold water in old-fashioned baptistries. People are tired. They're thinking now, what is that supposed to do? It's deep when you go in the water a crack at it and you come out the water a crack at it. What meaning is there to getting wet and your life has not changed? People are tired of these powerless rituals. Mm. 
And then what's real deep is when people come to find out that the rituals are not based in what is real. It's not based in what is true. Listen, listen, what does a person do when they find out that communion or what they call the Lord's Supper was not instituted by so-called Jesus? What does a person do when they come to understand that this ritual was actually in honor of a white pharaoh right. called Ptolemy the Fifth, right. Epiphanes, nickname Eucharistos. Right. See, I wasn't taught that growing up. I was taught that Jesus instituted this, but when I did my homework, good Lord have mercy, come to find out that almost two centuries B.C., they had a coronation ceremony for a European pharaoh known as Ptolemy the fifth Epiphanes and his nickname was Eucharistos and where that's where they got the word Eucharist from at his coronation they instituted a ritual of eating flesh and drinking blood and the Roman church carries that same ritual out in what is known today as the mass or communion don't take my word for it look up the Rosetta Stone write it down the Rosetta Stone go do your homework that's right. All of it's right there on the Rosetta Stone. Yes, sir. What does a person do when they come to realize that Barabbas and Jesus was the same person? Oh, let me blow your mind for a moment. It's a fictionalized story. They taught us that the crowd stood outside and said, give us Barabbas. Yes, yes. But they didn't tell you that, that Barabbas' first name was Jesus. Right. Go do your homework. <laughs> oh, it's a mind blower. Yes, sir. And then when you do an etymological study of the word Barabbas, you see that it is two words, not one. It's the word Bar Abba. Yes, sir. They turned it around and made it Barabbas. In Jewish custom, the prefix Bar means the son of. Abba means father. His first name was Jesus or Jesus. When you put it together, you got Jesus, the son of the father. What do you do when you find out that it's one and the same? So the people stood outside and said, give us Jesus, the son of the father. Although fictionalized. What does it do to a person when they come to realize that the so-called first man on this planet, who we've been all taught to call Adam, never historically existed? That messes up everything. When the beginning of your history starts with a fabricated individual, uh -huh. then you come to realize that the whole system you believed in is fabricated and it's a lie. Uh -huh. What does it do to a person when they come to find out that the word Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which uh -huh. simply means mankind yeah. <laughs> in Hebrew, not in Swahili. Uh -huh. To add insult to injury, what does it do to a person when they find out that what they thought was a unique, original, 
inspired writing is really nothing more than stolen, copied, plagiarized stories from much earlier accounts of other ancient cultural stories by thousands of years. I don't know if y'all remember hearing not too very long ago about this young man who broke in the Catholic Church not far from here. It was on the news. He broke in the Catholic Church. Now that's the only reason why I made the news. If he had broke in a Baptist church, he wouldn't have made the news. If he had broken in a Presbyterian church, he wouldn't have made the news. But he broke in a Catholic church. And it made the news. And they said that he threw the Virgin Mary down the stairs. And defaced Jesus. Now all that gold he didn't steal nothing. He didn't do any other damage inside that Catholic church. The only thing he did is he broke into the church and threw the Virgin Mary down the stairs and defaced Jesus. Now see, you can't help you. See y'all, being a psychologist, I wonder why he did that. <laughs> Maybe the demise of the Christian faith had already taken place in his mind. Maybe he came to realize that everything he was raised to believe was a lie. Who knows, he might have been an altar boy. He might have had to learn the catechism and go through all that training just to come to, I don't know, he might even listen to on one accord on Sunday mornings. I don't know. Something made him angry. We need to ask ourselves the questions, just what is the Christian faith? Let me define for you what the Christian, now I'm getting ready, listen y'all, I'm getting ready to say some stuff that even though many of you have been liberated, it's still going to hurt when I say it. Amen. You know why? Because like me, many of you, so much of your life was into this program. And the ramifications of such an attachment is still there for many of us. But as my brother said so well on the radio this morning, it's hard to compare a bucket of truth with a handful of faith. I like that. When you got a bucket of truth and a handful of faith, you better hold on to that bucket of truth. Just what is the Christian faith? The Christian faith is the belief in... Now before I go any further, please understand. You believe in something because you don't know any better. Let me restate it for you another way. When knowledge is present, faith ain't necessary. You don't need to believe that I'm holding a cloth in my hand. You know I'm holding a cloth in my hand. But now as deep as when I show you my hand and say, there's a cloth in my hand, just believe it. And you looking at my hand and you don't see no cloth, but yet you believe it anyway and you're willing to die for the fact that I'm holding a cloth in my hand and you looking at it and it ain't there. Oh, that's where we were. The Christian faith is the belief in, check this out, a set of doctrines or teachings that were determined and decreed by bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. Not one of them was black. You need to understand this. 
They decreed these doctrines and teachings in a multiplicity of what is called ecumenical councils. In fact, y'all, there were 21 of them. Starting in the year 325 AD, the Council of Nicaea, yes, yes. under the rule of Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, and from 325 AD to, to, to the year 1962, yes. a period of 1,637 years, the Roman Catholic Church been meeting. Yes. Changing their teachings and their doctrines over and over, trying to readjust them to fit because they knew they were a lie. All right. All right. All right. Look at the person next to you and say, the lie can't stand but for so long. Sooner or later, the truth is going to come out. From the first Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD to what is called Vatican II or the Second Vatican Council in 1962. The Roman Catholic Church has been adjusting the doctrines that they made up. However, despite the hundreds of canonical declarations and doctrines established by the Roman Catholic Church. Now hear what I'm getting ready to tell you. However, despite all that, the Christian faith hangs by the thread of one pivotal point. And that is something called the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later for all other doctrines that they made up. Later for baptism. Later for communion. Later for holy unction. Later for all that. There's this one doctrine that hangs by thread. It's called the resurrection of a so-called Jesus Christ. How many of y'all got your Bibles? I want you to read something with me. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and the 14th verse. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and the 14th verse. One more time. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and the 14th verse. If you have it, say, Ashe. Somebody who reads nice and loud, who got a good loud voice. Oh, go ahead, Karen, since you're standing, go right ahead. What does it say? And if Christ be not risen. And if. Big mistake already. And if Christ be not risen, what does it say? Then is our preaching vain. Our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also vain. That's all that verse says. What a thing to say. If he did get up. If he had rose from the grave. Let's put it this way. If I knew that somebody rose from the grave. I wouldn't be saying. If. He didn't get up. I'd, I'd be saying he got up, believe it or not. The question, the challenge here is, and if Christ be not risen, let me transliterate this for you. Transliterated, it would say it this way. If Jesus Christ died and never rose to life, then Christianity is a fraud. That's painful, isn't it? If he died and did not get up, Christianity is a fraud. You know why? Because the entire Christian faith hangs by that one string. Yes, sir. 
That's what that verse says. If he did not get up from the dead, our preaching is in vain and your belief is in vain. Look at the person next to you and repeat after me and say, I know it's painful. And it's not nice to have to hurt you like this. But how in the world can somebody who never existed get up out the grave? I'm sorry, people. I don't mean to be insensitive. But I got to tell you like it is. We're talking about a story that was fabricated by white folk. By the Roman Catholic Church. Don't get angry with me because they lied to you. said, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The tragedy here is believing in the supposed historical validity of this one central event is what has given Many sincere Christians, a genuine and eternal hope in the midst of a hurting and miserable world. Many people that you try to reach with the truth, the only thing they have to hold on to is the belief in that one string called the resurrection and guess what y'all y'all ever see uh the cartoons when 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 they're hanging on by a thread yeah. and then the thread or the rope starts unraveling uh -huh. you know and it's about to pop at any moment that's what that's where we are here yes sir yes sir praise god yes sir the very thing i just described to you scholars know this yes and they put it in a movie called The Body. We showed it here. The Body. It's a, it's a story, it's a movie about the fact that the resurrection never took place. And the Roman Catholic Church was prepared to take military action to keep that lie covered up. Yes, Go get the movie. One of the tragedies in the movie was one of the scholars of the Roman Catholic Church, when this evidence, undeniable evidence, was presented to him, he couldn't take it. And he went up on the roof of the temple and stood there and made the sign of distress. <laughs> off the roof and committed suicide because he came to realize that if Christ be not risen then my whole program is in vain. That's right. All right. That's right. This is why churches are drying up. This is why there is the demise of the Christian faith because people are starting to come to the realization of the truth that it's a fabrication. Yes, sir. Y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at what's coming out of my own mouth. Because 15 years ago, I would have punched myself in the face <laughs> for saying something like what I'm saying right now. But when you come to the knowledge of the truth, when you got a bucket full of truth, you can't compare that to a handful of faith. In 1985, 18 years ago, 30 theological scholars participated in the first session of what was called 
the Jesus Seminar. Some of you might remember reading about this. Even to today, this organization called the Jesus Seminar meets twice a year. And the reason why they meet is to debate over the authenticity of the biblical passage. At the close of each debate, these scholars, now let me show you how they do this, so that no one will know who voted a certain way. They do much like what they do in the Masonic Order. They vote by colored marbles. And they use these colored marbles to vote on the authenticity of Jesus' words or deeds. Wow. Now please understand, the purpose of the Jesus Seminar was to separate historical fact from fiction and mythology. The chairman of the seminar stated in their opening session, and I quote him, and again, you don't have to take my word for this. Go to the internet and type in the Jesus Seminar. It'll all come up. Read it for yourself. Yes, the chairman said these words, and I quote him, We are about to embark on a momentous enterprise. Uh -huh. Y'all hear this. He says, We are going to inquire simply, rigorously, after the voice of Jesus. Yeah. After what he really said. He goes on to say, in this process, we will be asking a question that borders the sacred. That may even be blasphemy for many in our society. He continues by saying, as a consequence, Check this out. As a consequence, the course we shall follow may prove hazardous. Wow. Look at the person next to you and say, they realize this is dangerous. He went on to say, the course we shall follow may prove hazardous. He goes on to say, we may well provoke hostility. Yes, but we will set out in spite of the dangers because we are professionals yes. and because the issue of Jesus must be dealt with. Yes. Since that meeting in 1985, 18 years ago, this group of 30 theological scholars, I didn't say 30 Baptist preachers who ain't get out of high school. I didn't say that. I didn't say 30 folks who just got up and say the Lord called me to preach. 30 theological scholars of the Jesus Seminar have concluded, and I quote, that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the virgin birth, all the miracles found in the gospel accounts yeah. and over 80% of the teachings normally attributed to Jesus are all false. Oh, <laughs> Ain't nobody attacking them. <laughs> they white folk. Black man come along and try to tell his own people the truth, and his own people want to destroy him. <laughs> it goes on to say, all of the mere, all of these biblical records have been rejected because these scholars have determined that they are merely legendary accretions with no historical foundation. Yes, sir. Look at the person next to you and say, when a people, when a people don't, have a past, don't have a past, they must create myth, must create myth to supplement the facts of their existence. We're at a 
critical and sensitive point in history, brothers and sisters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The lie has landed. Yes, the truth has risen yes, yes. and people are about to lose their mind. Yes, 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 yes. The lie has landed because it can't fly around forever. The truth has risen because truth pressed to the ground will rise again. And people are about to lose their mind because they don't know what else to do. Some will say, well, the Bible said this was going to happen. be a great falling away. Well, brothers and sisters, I do agree. Yes, an apostasy is taking place. But that's a good thing. Oh, follow what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with the word apostasy. For you see, the word apostasy simply means to abandon or turn away from what you used to believe. Oh, right. oh shucks now. So therefore, in context of the definition of the word apostate or apostasy, oh y'all, I have to confess to you. I am an apostate. I have to confess. Of the charge of apostasy. You know why? Because I have abandoned the lie that was taught to me. I have turned away from the lie that was taught to my mama and my daddy. I have turned away from the lie that was taught to my grandparents. I abandoned the lie that was taught to my great grandparents. Yes, I am an apostate. But that's a good thing. Because before I became an apostate, I was in bondage. Before I became an apostate, I had to try to be what racism said I'm supposed to be. Oh, shucks, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Just like me, the eyes of my African brothers and sisters are coming open to the truth. No longer, my African brothers and sisters, can you allow yourself to be psychologically and spiritually deceived? No longer. My African brothers and sisters, can you allow yourselves to walk around in the darkness of European propaganda? No longer, my African brothers and sisters, can you allow yourselves to attack each other, to destroy each other, all in the name of a religious figure that never existed? Ooh, Lord have mercy. No longer, my African brothers and sisters, can you allow yourself to put your trust in what is not real? No longer, my African brothers and sisters, can you allow yourselves to continue to give your finances and your support to a program that has been designed to perpetuate your enslavement. No longer, my African brothers and sisters, can you expect a God that don't look like you to try to make things better for you? Can't do that no more. This religious program yes, that was assigned to us yes, yes. called Christianity. Yes, right. It's about to die. Yes. It's about to kick the bucket. Yes. It's about to breathe its last breath. Yes. It's about to pass 
away. It's about to lose its power. And the reason for that, y'all, is because one truth can be used as a foundation for a mountain of lies. But God is sending messengers to our people all over the diaspora who have been chosen to dig down into that mountain of lies and grab that one truth that the mountain of lies was built on. And despite the resistance, despite the opposition, God's messengers are getting the power from God to take that truth and put it on top of the mountain of lies. Good Lord have mercy. Let me close by telling you what's happening. Good Lord help me today. That entire mountain of lies is starting to shake. That entire mountain of lies is starting to crack and break up under the weight of that one truth that's been set up on top of the mountain of lies. So I tell you, brothers and sisters, you got to be careful. Pastor Ray, be careful. Mentor Tip, be careful. Brother Elridge, be careful. Brother Stewart, be careful. Brother Simmons, be careful. Every last one of you, be careful. Because this is a dangerous point we're at. They don't want that mountain of lies to come down. But it's coming down. When I was a little boy, we used to sing the song. Satan, we're gonna tear your kingdom down. Well, it's coming down. It's coming down, doggone it. Oh, yes it is. It's coming down. So I'm asking you today, lift up your head and rejoice with me. Because the reverberation of the truth is going to awaken our people. Some of you are in pain because those who you've tried to communicate with don't want to hear what you got to say. That ain't your problem. As long as they're not deaf. can hear sound. I'm reminded of Brother Eldridge's testimony. He used to say to me, bro, Doc, my wife is having a hard time with this, but I leave the computer on so she can hear the teaching. That's what does it, y'all. Truth the reverberation of the truth. People may not want to respond to it, but it's so powerful that once your ears, once it reaches your eardrum, your brain takes over from that point. Like it or not, your brain grabs hold of what your eardrum heard. Messes with your paradigm. Yeah. You may walk around with your lip hanging out, yeah. but your brain is digesting yeah. what your eardrum heard. Yeah. Well, I got news for you. Yes. I'm happy today. Yeah. I'm happy because I see the awakening yeah. taking place. Yeah. Our people got to wake up yes. because God's truth will not return to him void, but it will accomplish that wh 
what it was sent to do. And because of that, Africans and Africa will be free. Ashe. Ashe. 